Welcome to the podcast for the West Side Church of Christ that meets in Killeen, Texas. Today we bring you another practical lesson from God's inspired word, the Bible. Well, the Hebrews chapter 12, if you would. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to go ahead and read the first three verses here. Familiar passage, I think, to pretty much all of us. The writer here telling us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, keep in mind, he's writing about all the people he just wrote about in chapter 11 and more, but he gives us a list, remember, of the so-called Hall of Heroes or Hall of the Faithful or something along those lines in chapter 11. So he's reminding us of this, right? Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. There's a whole lot here to unpack. Lots of stuff to talk about. But real quickly, let's look at three things that this passage tells us. And yes, we're going to do a lesson on each one. But first, he says, the writer tells us there, to look to those who have run before. We have this great cloud of witnesses, this great group of people we have seen who have done this before. So you could think of it as, again, a stadium full of people like Moses and Abraham and Peter and Paul cheering you on to run, to finish. You could think of it as, these are a whole bunch of people who have borne witness to the fact that this can be done and that God is faithful to do His part in that, which is really the important part. And again, go back and read chapter 11 and you read about some great people. You also read about some not-so-great people, but who at least had a moment of faith, right? People like Samson and Jephthah. I mean, we kind of wonder, like, how are they in this list? Well, they had this moment of faith at least where they did and they acted on what God said. And then you read about some of the big ones, right? Moses is in there and Abraham's in there and Sarah's in there, a bunch of people. And then he just says there's a whole bunch of other people I don't have time to list who did all this stuff because they trusted in God. So you have this enormous amount of people who have bore witness or are bearing witness still today that this can be done. So they're there for us to look to for inspiration. If they can do it, then so can you. And if they can do it, then so can I. And we're going to spend the bulk of the lesson kind of thinking about that, but maybe in a different way than you've done so before. The second part that the writer does, he says, now, okay, these people have done it, now look to yourself. What do you need to do to make this happen? And the major point that is made here is we need to remove the weight, the things that ensnare us, that entangle us, that weigh us down. And he says the sins and the things that entangle us. So obviously sin are the things, are some of the things we need to get rid of. Everything or anything that hinders our progress in this race. Especially sin, but might not be sin, might be things that are good in in many ways, but for whatever reason they are hindering us in this uh, race. So you think about an athlete, a runner, they're not deciding when they're choosing, you know, what they're going to wear and what they're going to carry between good and bad, they're choosing between the, the good and the best. What's the best thing that I can be doing here? They're choosing between what's necessary and what's unnecessary, and they're cutting a very fine line there so that they can maximize their ability to run really far or really fast or both. Again, I'll send you to Sebastian for how to do that. So the question there sort of becomes, what will we we lay aside, what will we sacrifice in order to finish the race? 
and yes, we need to get rid of the sin that's in our lives, of course. But what else do we need to get rid of? Think about the rich young ruler. That guy was rich, and he, he was doing pretty much everything G, G God wanted. And Jesus says, but you, and he's specifically talking to this man, your problem is you, that you're rich. There's nothing wrong with being rich. But this guy, it hindered him from following God. So he said, sell your stuff. And of course, the guy said, I can't do that. Perfectly fine to be rich unless it gets in the way of running this race. It could be family. Jesus says you might have to sacrifice your family. That's a harsh thing to say. Uh, but Jesus said in uh, Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. If it come, came down to it, what would you do? And I'm, I'm saddened to say that most of the time when I've seen this come up, the person chooses their family rather than God, and they leave. Or they just aren't really here. Same difference. Right? So that's possible. Again, what will we give up? We'll do a lesson on that soon. And then the third point here is to look to Jesus. Well, he's the founder, ESV says, I read, the founder and finisher of our faith. Some of the other translations say the author and perfecter of our faith. It's the same thing. He created it. He did it. He did it first. He's the the preeminent one. Again, you could read Colossians, read about Jesus being the first in all these different categories. He's the best example. So, yes, all these other people did it, but Jesus did it too, and he did it 100% perfectly. So he's, our, he's the bar. Fortunately, though, there's other people that have done it without being perfect. That's where we are. And that's why we can look to this great cloud of witnesses, again, the point today, and get encouragement for, for our own race. Okay? Jesus, of course, showed us the way by offering himself as the sacrifice, and then we can look to Jesus and say, well, how did Jesus handle things? So that's a great way to go. Because he always handled them perfectly. Every, everyone else we might look at, they failed somewhere. And I failed somewhere, and you failed somewhere. But again, the good news is, Jesus is the... The example, but Jesus is not the standard in the sense that we don't have to be Jesus in order to be saved, in order to finish the race. We have to finish the race, the race that God set, and we have to do it, and we do it again by casting these things down. So this is how we run with endurance, right? We understand that people have done it before, and, and that gives us the encouragement to say, well, I can do this. That's kind of a, a nature of the beast. Once someone figures out how to do something, before that, everyone will say it can't be done. And then someone will do it. And then everyone else will start doing it. And that's, just, that's how human nature works. Well, it's been done. It's been done millions of times, billions of times, no doubt, over the course of history, of people who have followed the Lord. But I want to focus back on this first point, those, this great cloud of witnesses. And, and really what the rest, most of the rest of this is, it's kind of a thought experiment. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and just sort of answer them to yourselves. Probably don't want to raise hands for most of this. But I want you to just kind of consider something. And this idea that there is a great cloud of witnesses, there are a huge number of people who have run the race that you and I are on, but what were they like? Well, they were like you and they were like me. So think about this. Just kind of answer these questions in your mind. Have you ever lied to protect yourself from you know, problems at work or you know, that kind of thing, right? Have you ever sort of told a lie or maybe just didn't say anything, right? To make things go easier for yourself because maybe you were afraid that you might lose a job or you might get ridiculed or whatever. Abraham did that. Right? On a couple of occasions, he lied about his Sarah, his wife, to protect himself and herself, you know, all this, right? And while. God doesn't necessarily come out and condemn Abraham for this. We understand the importance of truth and so on. 
But God had mercy on Abraham, despite the fact that, that he was weak in this regard, didn't he? Abraham is the one God made a bunch of promises. Now, again, the promises are, uh, the, the big promises aren't based on so much on whether Abraham is faithful or not, but Abraham's own response is one of faith, right? Remember, we talked about last week, God's arms are not shortened that he cannot redeem. He will do everything exactly the way he promised, uh, in spite of what you or I may do. But Abraham was faithful. Read Romans 4, get a whole sort of treatise on how that worked. Abraham did what God said, so he was faithful. That's it. So Abraham was showed mercy, even though, again, he didn't always do the right thing. We might say, I might ask this question, have you ever looked on another person with lustful thoughts, acted on them? David did. And yet, God extended mercy to him. Nathaniel read Psalm 16. I don't know exactly when David wrote Psalm 16. I imagine it was sort of early in his life when he was running from his, for his life and you know, all this kind of stuff. And he, he was uh, kind of in trouble all the time from Saul or the Philistine. Somebody was chasing him a lot when he was younger. And he's, he's reminding himself that God's not going anywhere. Right? So here's David, of course, the sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and all of that horrific stuff that was done. God showed him mercy. There was consequence. child died and there was a lot of nonsense, of course, that happens now within the kingdom because of how David did that. But David was shown mercy even though he participated in these sins. Have you ever hurt somebody because you knew you were right and they were wrong? And you just, you went after them, or you argued with them, or you fought with them, or maybe it got physical and you were right and they were wrong. Or at least you thought you were. Paul did that, didn't he? Saul of Tarsus, the great Pharisee, did that. He knew he was so right that he was willing to take people's lives for it. Yet God showed him mercy. And in fact, God chose him to be an apostle to the Gentiles, a special job that no one else really had. And yet that hounded him, haunted him for his whole life. He writes about it often. Even though he says, I did it in good conscience, I know it was wrong. you imagine having that follow you around, that weight? Yet God had mercy on him. How many of you have ever been so angry with someone? Or maybe so jealous of someone? And a lot of times those two go together. That you wanted to hurt them, or maybe you did, or you wanted to kill them. Maybe you did. Jesus does tell us hate and murder kind of go hand in hand in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21 following. So maybe you didn't actually follow through, but you wanted to. Cain did that. And yet God showed mercy to him. Remember, he got, he got in trouble, getting consequences, and Cain said, hey, everyone's going to kill me. And God said, okay, I'll put a mark on you so no one does, and I'll punish them if they harm you. So, you know, I don't know what Cain's final status was, but I know right there he, he knew and trusted in God. And God extended mercy to him. He didn't have to. Part of the lesson here is this is the kind of God we have. Brian led this song. I don't know that I've sung that song in a long time, maybe ever. Great song. Love that song. Because God's the Father. He's our loving Father. And that's what parents do. Right, But again, Cain, Cain did that. He killed his own brother because he was angry, because he was jealous, and yet God showed him mercy. Have you ever hidden your faith to protect yourself? Again, Peter did, remember? Jesus told him, you're going to die me three times, and then he did. And what was, what was the scene? They, were, they were, had arrested Jesus, and they were in the process of this bogus trial and Peter's sort of 
trailing behind, trying to figure out what's going on, and people went, hey, weren't you one of those guys? Oh, no. The third time, he's cursing and swearing up and down that he has no idea who this guy Jesus is. And yet, God showed him mercy. Peter lived on, and of course becomes a pillar of the church, right? I mean, how many of us have done these things? Probably getting to the point where we can all raise our hand on at least one of these. Have you ever been so tempted by something you knew, you absolutely know for a fact was wrong, and yet you gave in anyway? And we can all go there, right? Eve and Adam did that. I mean, they had one rule. Have you thought about this? One rule. You might say our lives are a little more complicated than that. They had one thing not to do. And they did it. And yes, there were consequences. They got booted out of the garden and all this. They lost access to the tree of life. And they created a whole bunch of problems for the rest of us. Thank you. No thank you. But God had mercy. Yes, they were punished, but they, were, they lived. And, and there were consequences, but they moved on. And God had mercy on them. Have you ever laughed at or been sort of just unbelieving in God? You know, maybe you didn't literally laugh like Sarah did when she was told by the angels or when she overheard the angels telling Abraham, hey, you're going to have a child. And Abraham's like, I don't think so. Sarah can't. And they said, nope, she will. And she laughed. Can you imagine? But I think mentally, in our minds, we, we, maybe we read stuff or we hear people say stuff and we just go, that's ridiculous. We're just kind of doubtful, unbelieving. And Sarah did that, yet again, God showed her mercy. He didn't, he didn't excommunicate her or wipe her out. He fulfilled exactly what he said he was going to do. She did have the child, of course. Maybe you have the most insane family problems. Right? People don't get along. People are fighting all the time. People don't like each other. There's all sorts of drama and problems. You ever read about Joseph? So Joseph, of course, has, you know, he has a bunch of brothers and sisters, right? I think more than any of us have. And they couldn't stand him. Now, some of that he brought on himself because, you know, he kind of was a little bit, um, a little bit of a punk, let's be honest, when he was young. But God sent him these visions, and he goes and tells them all. But you, I get the sense when I read that that he's like, uh -huh, see. See, you know, big brother, see what's going to happen. And they, ended up, they end up thinking about killing him. Reuben sort of saves him by, by suggesting, I'll oh, sell him into slavery instead, right? Tries to save him later, but they've already done it. But imagine uh, Jacob, the father. He's got problems, right? Four wives. All, and they don't not like each other necessarily and all these kids and it's it's you, you think you have drama right well again joseph was in that same spot and he was part of the problem now god's going to use him he certainly shows him mercy but after a while right joseph gets sold into slavery he's a slave but god helps him out but then he gets accused of uh uh, you know, sexual advances on the master's wife, which was actually the opposite of what was happening. She was advancing on him, and he ran away, and he gets in trouble again, and he ends up in Pharaoh's prison for years. And again, yes, he's finally elevated. God had mercy on him and used him for these good things. Joseph learned some lessons in there. You, you may have crazy family problems like that. God will have mercy on you too. Have you lost loved ones to tragic events? We probably all have. Think about John, the apostle. James and John are always talked about together. They fish together. They, they work together. They did everything together. And then who's one of the first people to get killed? James. That's how John felt. His, his, his best friend got beheaded because he was preaching the gospel. Yet God showed him mercy too. John actually is the one who lives the longest and you know in that sense sort of I guess maybe has the best life. John saw things that no one else saw. 
and wrote about them. But again, he, he went on, he moved on, he ran the race despite the fact that he lost this. Have you ever had, or do you have, a rebellious child? Samuel did, he had two. He appointed his own sons to be judges, and they were terrible. They were corrupt, they were awful. Yet, Samuel is still doing his thing. Samuel is given mercy, and God, again, used Samuel for many, many good things. Have you ever just doubted? Thomas doubted, right? guy who knew Jesus, a guy who had heard all of the talk and all of the instructions from Jesus said, no, nah, I don't think so, that doesn't sound right. And he had to physically touch the Lord. Jesus showed him mercy there, God certainly showed him mercy. Have you ever been so rooted in material things that they just sort of take over and make up everything about your life and you're almost proud of that? Hezekiah did that. The greatest king since David in Judah. And remember, among all the good, all the good things that he did, he sort of displayed all of his wealth and you know, sort of bragged to the Babylonian envoys and everything, and God said, Well, all that's going to disappear because you did this. So even this great king, we see in a great king David, now this great king Hezekiah, they had their serious failings, and yet God showed mercy on them. Again, Hezekiah was granted extra time, and he saved Judah for a while, and he's a great king. A couple more. You know, we could go on and on for hours. We're not going to do that. Have you ever been a coward? And just said, I'm afraid to do what God wants me to do. Moses was. Remember, he, he threw every excuse at God that he could find. I'm not who I was. I can't talk. Yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. God said, who do you think made your mouth? Right? So Moses was a coward. But, but who, you know, what happens to him? He changed. But God showed him mercy. didn't just, you know, God could have just went, okay, I'll find someone else. But no, he showed him mercy. Have you ever manipulated people to getting what you want? Rebecca did that to her husband because of her son, right? And God, again, showed mercy on these people. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever? We could go on and on and on, right? Here's the point. None of these people were perfect. All of these people were not they they were we say flawed like uh, a diamond is flawed right all diamonds are flawed if they're real and they're beautiful and they're valuable and they're precious what i mean is these people were flawed like the diamond was smashed by a hammer and then what's it worth right let's remember that they're not diamonds we're not diamonds in that sense we're precious and all that don't get me wrong None of these people were perfect. But all of these people, at one point or another, even Cain, acted out of faith somewhere and said, God, help me. You know, and we didn't go into all the details of all of these people, but even Cain at one point said, God, I can't handle this. Help me out. And he did. God did. And again, all through these other individuals that are mentioned in chapter 11 or some of the ones we mentioned here, this is the point. As we noted last week, God's arms are not shortened that He cannot redeem. There's nothing you or I can do that will take us out of the reach of God's saving hand, except to keep running. But if we want to come back, we can come back. All these people in various forms came back. However, it is noted throughout Scripture that it is those people of faith who God saves. And only those people. Which is why we have that list there. And even Samson in the end came around. As, you know, kind of horrible as his life and attitude and ungodly everything was about this man in the end, for him anyway, he stood tall. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So that's the key here. So some of the people we read about were New Testament people. They had faith in Jesus Christ. Many of them were Old Testament people. They had faith in God. They couldn't have faith in Jesus Christ yet. Same thing, though. We're in the era where faith in Jesus Christ is the thing that matters. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. So the the death, right? He had to die. His blood was spilled to usher in this new covenant to be received by faith. There it is again. This was to show God's righteousness because of, in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So they did it because they had faith. They didn't do it because they were perfect. They didn't do it because they were special. They didn't do it because they were great. They did it because they had faith. And they failed, and some failed miserably more than once. Now, some people hear that and they go, great. Doesn't matter what I do. Look at these people. That's the danger, right? Good thing we have other passages that remind us that's just not the case. Romans 6, verse 1, verse 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Again, I think that's a great question if you're sort of following what's going on. If God is so gracious and merciful to us, and think about again what we read in Hebrews, all these incredibly flawed people are held forth as examples because at least at one point in their life, they were faithful. And we might go, well, that's all that matters. i just, I got to get that one time in. And the rest doesn't matter. No. Right? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, or God forbid, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And that is ever present before us. You know that. But, especially the people from the Old Testament, we have better knowledge than they do. We have better information than they have. We have the Word of God, the complete Word of God. They saw parts of it, glimpses of it. They never had a full understanding or appreciation. Again, even even the apostles, it took them their entire lives to get there. They didn't just wake up one morning and it's all in there. They had to work at it too. And then they had to teach it. And then the people, the, 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 the churches had to learn it. You read Acts and all the letters. That's like 40 years of history there. This stuff is not happening just overnight. Because people take time to change. We need to grow up individually and collectively, and so on. So, but, but we have better information, better knowledge. We should be better at this. Hebrews 11, uh, just back up a little bit. Again, he gives us this list, uh, several people long, and then like, like Abel, right, and, so, and, and Abraham, and so on. He says in verse 13, Hebrews 11, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So in a sense, we're still in, in part of that. We haven't seen the full fulfillment of this kingdom of Christ that is coming. But we're in the kingdom now, here on this earth. But he goes on. All right? so, so we're, again, we're, we, Peter tells us we're pilgrims and exiles, right? And, and we're to live that way as sojourners. For people who speak thus make it clear, uh, they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunities to return. They could have just gone home. Kind of like Israel, you know, Moses, why did you take us out here just to die in the wilderness? Let's go back to slavery. It was great. It's ridiculous. But we do that. Remember the old days? The old days were great. The old days were better. No, they're not. They're the same. The same problem of sin exists in every day. That, uh, that we live. Okay? If they had been thinking of that land, they, which they had gone out, they could have, would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. So they're no different than we are. They're acting on faith. The little bit that God gave them, they acted on faith. We have much more to work with. Our faith ought to be greater. 
Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And then you read passages like Luke chapter 11. So here's Jesus preaching. He's in the middle of his ministry. Luke chapter 11. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nurse. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Was Jesus, was Mary blessed? Oh yeah. The angel said so. You're blessed among women to bear this child. You know, you are special because of this thing you're going to do. But what's more special? What's more blessed? Those who hear the word and keep it. And back to Thomas, right? Thomas doubted and Jesus said, well, here's my hands. Here's my side. You know, go ahead. Let me prove it. Thomas answered him. John 20, verse 28. The Lord of my God Jesus said, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And all, all this and more, right? What, who are the great cloud of witnesses? All those people and more. Hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands. People we read about in scripture. People we can read about in history. And many, many millions at least who will never know their names. All these and more have run so that you and I can run. So that you and I can be encouraged to run. But there's more. All of these, right here in this room, are running together and again to give us the encouragement to be able to run ourselves. When you're slowing down, pick you up. When, you're, when I'm slowing down, pick me up. When you need help, we help you. When I need help, you help me. And so on. This is why we gather together. This is why we stir one another up. This is why we spend time together. This is why we study together. This is why we learn God's word and will together. This great cloud of witnesses is there to motivate us to keep going. We've probably all been there on one side or the other, playing sports. I've Look, I grew up in California, okay? No one went to our football games. They had other things to do. It's not like Texas, where when I moved to Palestine, Texas in 1999, I, had, I thought the Dallas Cowboys were in town on Friday night in the fall. Because literally the entire town, I guess except for me, was over there. There were thousands of people watching these 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds play football. We didn't even have our own real stadium. We had to use somebody else's. My dad only went because he wanted to be there when I got hurt, which fortunately never happened. Oh, I played baseball. Maybe 30 people would show up to most baseball games. You know, it's aggravating. But I got to play in some, some bigger games later uh, as I got further along in, in school, and we played a couple of playoff games state level, and there were thousands of people there. And let me tell you, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. And if you have people cheering you on, whether they're cheering you on specifically, or they're cheering your team on, or what have you, it makes a difference. And everyone who's ever played those, those sports like that will tell you that's the case. As hard as you want to compete, it makes a difference. Because it helps. That's why there's home field advantage when you play in Kyle Field and in College Station, because they're loud. Or Kansas City, I'm told, is loud. Okay, we have each other. We're going to sing this song as, a, again, a chance of reflection. I think just in that list I read, all of us could raise our hand more than once that, yes, I've been guilty of those things. So, yes, that doesn't mean I'm out of the race unless I let those things overwhelm me and overcome me, unless I refuse to repent of those things, unless I refuse to change and keep running the race, because I get out of the race. Part of the key to this is to run the race set before us, the one God set before us. The race has boundaries. You can't cheat those boundaries and expect to win. And we do that when we sin and that sort of, that sort of thing. So we're going to sing the song again. Perhaps you recognize right now that you need forgiveness, you need help, now would be a great time to uh, address that. Perhaps you realize 
there are prayers to be offered on your behalf, that would be a great time to address that. Perhaps you recognize, hey, I've not really put my full faith in God yet. Now would be a good time to address that, whether it's I just haven't done it at all and I need to come to him and confess him as my Savior, repent of my sins and become baptized for the remission of those sins. Maybe there's some here that need to do that. Most of us have, and so, but maybe we're just not as committed as we should. Again, maybe that's something you want to discuss with me or Bobby and Sebastian, the elders. Maybe that's something you want to just pray about or think about there or talk with anyone about. Whatever the case is, let us know as we stand and as we stand. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you are ever in the Colleen area, we'd certainly love to have you worship with us. You can learn more about us and our times of worship at westsidecolleen.com. Tune in next time and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. All together worthy, all together wonderful too.